The League of Women Voters is a national nonpartisan organization formed to encourage citizen participation in government. It never supports or opposes any political party or candidate. The statements and opinions of the candidates are presented solely in the interest of public service and in no way are to be construed as an endorsement thereof by the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters takes no responsibility for any of the views or facts stated by the candidates. Good evening. Good evening, candidates and audience. Welcome to this forum for the State Senate 9th District and State Representative 55th District election. I am Carla Barrows Wiggins, a member of the League of Women Voters Oakland area. I am not a resident of any of these districts. The League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan political organization, encourages informed and active participation in government works to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy. It is the League's intention that following this forum, you will be informed and able to cast a responsible vote. Tonight, we will be introducing the candidates seeking election to the position of State Senate 9th District. This position is a four-year term with an annual salary of $71,685. The district includes the cities of Rochester, Rochester Hills, and Troy. We will also present the candidates competing for the position of State Representative 55th District. This position is a two-year term with an annual salary of $71,685. The district includes the cities of Rochester, Rochester Hills, and one precinct in Oakland Township. Views expressed at this forum are those of the candidates. The League does not take responsibility for these views. The format for this forum has been established by the League and the candidates have signed a pledge to abide by the ground rules. We ask that the audience remain silent during the forum and turn off all cell phones. Following the opening statements, candidates will respond to questions from members of our audience. Questions can be directed to any or all of the candidates. Each candidate will have the opportunity to respond to any of the questions. Responses to questions will not be timed, but candidates have been asked to limit their answers to two minutes or less. Follow-up and rebuttal to questions will be allowed, but will be limited to 30 seconds. The order of who responds first will rotate. Questions and responses may only address issues that pertain to the position of the office the candidate is seeking. We ask you to please hold all applause until the conclusion of this program. We will now begin with the opening statements with State Senate Democrat candidate Padma Kupa. Good evening and thank you to the Oakland Area League of Women Voters and all of you in the audience. Uh, my name is Padma Kupa. I'm currently the state representative for the House District 41, which includes and encompasses the cities of Troy and Clawson. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, and I'm an engineer. I worked in the automotive industry prior to coming to the legislature to serve. I am serving in my second term. I'm a longtime community volunteer and have been appointed to positions in the city of Troy, including planning commission. I've served on nonprofit boards. I've worked across uh, the spectrum from small business to automotive companies. And I look forward to responding to questions at this candidate forum where we will make our positions clear on what we would do for the uh, communities of Troy, Rochester, Rochester Hills, Western Sterling Heights, Utica, and a few precincts in Oakland and Shelby Townships. Thank you. Thank you. And now State Senate Republican candidate Michael Weber. I want to start off by thanking the League of Women Voters for hosting this candidate forum. And thank you to all of you for attending and, and those that are watching at home. My name is Michael Weber and I'm proud to be back in the Rochester Hills City Council Chambers where it all started for me, serving for seven years on the Rochester Hills City Council. 
I grew up in the greater Rochester area, went to school here at, at Rochester Adams High School. I've been a licensed insurance agent since 2010, and I still call Rochester Hills home with my wife, Julia, and son, James. I'm honored to have served as a state representative for six years after my time on the city council. Given the redistricting and the new district lines, I'm now running to serve as your state senator. It would be an honor to represent you again, offering responsible, effective leadership in Lansing. I look forward to your questions tonight. Thank you. And now state representative Democrat candidate, Patricia Bernard. Good evening and thank you for hosting us. My name is Dr. Patricia Bernard, and I am a resident of Rochester Hills for 28 years. I am a mother of three sons who are all graduates of Rochester Community Schools. They were able to receive a quality education, so they are now all college graduates. And so I am definitely for supporting our public schools. Also, I feel your pain every time you go to the pump because I'm the CEO of a semi-truck company where I help, to help women get involved in a male-dominated environment. We've been able to deliver within our community during the pandemic a lot of essential products. So those empty shelves that you saw out there, we were able to fill those up. I understand supply chain issues, chip shortages, part shortages, your car goes into the shop, it disappears now. And why do I understand that? Because I retired from the Department of Army as a GS-15 equivalent to a colonel, and I made sure the soldier got whatever he needed. Whether he shot it, wore it, drove it, that's logistics. From a health perspective, took care of my dad the last few years of his life. He had three different insurances, and I found that, wow, he had an $800 prescription. I couldn't believe it. And last but not least, I am for our environment. I'm for making sure that we keep our air and our water clean and that we do not want to do any type of uh, drilling or anything within our community. Thank you. Thank you. And now, State Representative Republican candidate Mark Tisdall. Well, thank you, League of Women Voters, and for everyone coming out tonight. I've had the privilege of living, working, volunteering, raising a family, and being an elected official here in this city for, for 33 years total. For eight years, I served right here in this auditorium as an at-large member of the city council and four of those years as council president. Now I'm asking to be reelected to the House of Representatives where I've been named legislator of the year in both 2021 and 2022. I've had four pieces of legislation signed into law in just the first 19 months. I have a good working relationship with the school board, with Dr. Shaner, with the city councils, with Mayor Barnett, Mayor Bixon, and Supervisor Abbott. I'm asking for your vote and another term in our state capitol. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Now for our first question from the audience. Hi everyone. First, I want to thank the candidates for showing up this evening. It's very um, important that you know we have this forum as constituents or potential constituents that we can ask questions. So I think that one of the big things that I've dealt with as everyone in the audience during the pandemic is, you know, I have kids in school and I have a student at Michigan State. And my student at Michigan State and a lot of people in the state of Michigan faced issues with potential vaccine mandates. And I want to know from each of the candidates, what are your opinions on, should that be something that the government can enforce? My son had to get a vaccine to go to school or get a religious exemption. So my question is around medical freedom. And as a legislature, what would you do, if anything, to try to keep that medical freedom intact for the constituents? Thank you. We'll start with Padma Kupa. Thank you. I thought you were going to rotate who is going to go first. We are. Okay. Starting with the next question. All right. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I believe that local control is essential and that working with your local school board is very important to ensure that decisions are made that are in the best interest of public safety and welfare. 
I'm not a medical professional, but I would rely on the advice of epidemiologists and medical professionals to uh, make the advice that is necessary for each community school district um, to make their uh, decisions. Thank you. And now, Michael Weber. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question. And, um, you know, certainly the, the um, pandemic was a very trying time for our state and nation. Um, you know, it, the, the vaccine did come out at, uh, you know, record time or near record time. Um, but I think in terms of the schools, the vaccine should be treated as, as some of the other vaccines have been treated in terms of being able to have exemptions and, and parents, you know, um, you know, being able to have a say in that. Um, and so I do support medical freedom where, where we can, but I do think, and I think that that's a great example of these school districts being able to, you know, offer some of those exemptions. So. Thank you. And now Patricia Bernard. Well, you know, I think in terms of when the pandemic hit, no one knew what was going on and a lot of things happened late. And as a result of that, I believe that's why we're still dealing with this pandemic. So I believe that we all need to be in sync. And yes, where there's an opportunity to have medical freedom, great. But when they're asking people to wear a mask and some people say they want their freedom not to wear a mask, I'm not in agreement with that. I believe that we need to believe in our doctors and believe in our science. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Mark Tisdall. Well, uh, thank you. And, you know, I, I believe we have to take, the, our kids need five different vaccines to attend school right now. And as a conservative, you know, my definition of conservative is someone who conserves or preserves those things with a long history of doing good. And certainly the vaccines that are required right now do have a long history of doing good. The COVID-19 vaccine that was brought to market in record time using a relatively, relatively new technology and brought to market under a, an emergency use authorization, typically those emergency youth authorizations have given a lot more leeway to people relative to mandates and requirements. And so with proven track record, we do want to preserve or conserve those things with a long record of doing good. When something is coming to the market quickly, um, you, you do have to give people more, more leeway. Thank you. And for our next question, Thank you. Uh, it is my understanding uh, legislation at the federal level in the last couple of years created funding at the state level helping tr to produce a budget surplus for Michigan. There are those that uh, believe this federal spending contributed to our current inflationary environment. With that in mind, how has or can these funds been leveraged for relief and benefit of individuals in Michigan, the tax, individual taxpayers, as well as small business owners who have suffered under this inflationary environment. Thank you. We'll start this one with Michael Weber. All right, very uh, good question. And um, certainly I, I feel that the money that's been infused into the system by the, the federal government has contributed to to the inflationary uh, nature that that we're in now, um, and and the last time we had this type of inflation, I was a very very young little boy uh, during the Jimmy Carter uh, era. Um, but in terms of how we can leverage some of these dollars, I know that the state government, and I'm not currently in the state government, but I know that the state government has been looking towards some tax relief um, to try to help folks. There's a lot of anxiety as, as I go door to door, that's one of the number one issues that people talk about is the inflation and how it's affecting their family, looking at it from, from a week to week, month to month basis. And um, you know, it's, it's almost to the point where it's taken, or I believe is going to take one month's worth of salary um, out of people's paychecks to 
to you know keep up with this kind of inflation. So I think there's the the state government has to spend that money very wisely. Look at look at needs. Um, you know, one that comes to mind certainly is the uh, the unemployment fund. I mean, we have. Um, we had a lot of people that were on unemployment during the pandemic, and that, that made a lot of sense because a lot of things were shut down. But now they're, they're asking these employers to now contribute back into that fund when they, they felt like th this was going to be taken care of some way, shape, or form. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Obviously, our roads and infrastructure, we can always, and I, and I, I know the, le the current legislators can talk about the, the money that's been put into that. Um, and you know, there's several other projects. So, I mean, you got to look at it from a standpoint of what, what are the needs and, and knowing that that's one time money, how can we best use that? Thank you. Patricia Bernard. Okay, well, when I think in terms of inflation and what's going on, I think it's a balancing act. When you start looking at the fact that right now, I know the interest rates are going up. We benefited the last couple of years where homes were just, you couldn't even find a home and now the rates are going up, so it's gonna make it a little more challenging, but we need to prioritize um, and bring our experts together to figure that out. But as a result of the pandemic, as a result of uh, the war, we've got some crazy things going on now, so even the experts are trying to figure it out. So we just need to establish our priorities and figure that out. But I also would also like to say this too. When they were giving out PPP, Paycheck Protection Program, and all of these SB, all of these loans to a lot of these big corporations, nobody had a problem. But now when they want to take care of student loan debt, everybody has a problem. So that's interesting to me. So we just need to really prioritize. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Tisdall. Yes, the, the, <laughs> from 2008 to 2021, the Fed balance sheet went from $900 billion to $9 trillion. That's a tenfold increase in, 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 in a relatively short period of time. That's, in, that's inflationary. We have 300, or 3 million fewer workers participating in the workforce today than we did at the at the beginning of the of the uh, uh, pandemic, there are four million more people on Medicaid. All of those things are inflationary. Uh, the price of gasoline, no, no one needs to fill you in on that. Gasoline and 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 fuel touch the price of everything that we put that we that, that we purchase, and it has to be moved around. At the state level, we've, we've using some of these federal dollars that have come back to us, 2.6 billion of those dollars have been used to pay down debt. And that will have lasting results for, for, for decades. That will be interest that we won't be required to pay. We will be required to pay the interest on the trillions of dollars of debt that's been added and the trillions of dollars of relief that's come out that's that's all borrowed money and we'll be servicing that debt for a long long time so you have to spend it on things that have a multi-year shelf life not something that's going to be gone at the end of the month and and relative to the ppp and, and comparing that to the 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 relief or transfer of student loans ppp was always designed to be forgiven if the majority of the money went to uh, the employees from the employer. That was always designed to be forgiven because it, it was helping to uh, uh, mitigate a, a government-mandated uh, lockdown. Thank you. Padma Kupa. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your question. I acknowledge the challenges. I, too, feel the pain when every time I go to the pump or when we go to buy groceries, with the increased numbers. Um, but I'm an engineer, I look at the numbers. And as a state legislature, legislator, I look at what we can do in the state legislature. And one of the things I did was vote for the gas tax holiday when it made sense, when it was fiscally responsible. I would continue as the state senator to look at decisions on how it impacts our district 
and ensure that both employers and employees and retirees and families have an opportunity to achieve the American dream, just starting paycheck by paycheck. Thank you. Yeah. Couple questions here, then I'll come over there. First of all, thank you for giving us the opportunity to ask you questions. And my question is for all the candidates. Um, IRS has been authorized to hire 87,000 agents. And one of the requirements is that they should be able to bear and use arms. So my question is kind of two-pronged. One is, who are these agents going to target? Are they going to target the rich or the average middle class? Because that's where the most money is with the middle class. And based on what I have read, there are only 724 billionaires in the country. So my question is, why do you need 87,000 uh, agents, and why do they need guns and arms? Thank you. We'll start with Patricia Bernard. <laughs> OK. So I'm trying to really kind of digest all what he just said to be very honest about it. But you said something about 7,000 agents. Are you talking about what? I'm sorry. 87,000 IRS agents? Are you talking about IRS agents? <laughs> OK. Well, I mean, you know, I think in terms of the fact, when I look at, when, they, when I read and hear that whether a person makes 145000 or 145 million, they all pay the same thing in the Social Security. The engineer is down here. She's kind of the number counter, but it just doesn't make sense to me to see that if someone has all this money, they only have to pay the same amount as someone that made 145000 on their job, estimated. So I feel that we need to, everyone needs to pay their fair share. Thank and so you. the agents, they're saying they need them to try to obtain all this money back because so much money is out there. And when you think in terms of even when the money was given for the businesses, a lot of businesses, some of them gave the money back because they didn't even need it. Now, I'm for small business. But when I started thinking about how things are unfairly being done, you know, they're saying they need these agents to make sure they can get their money back, I guess, you know. So it has to be prioritized. Uh, the question was about included guns. Why do they need guns? Oh, why do the agents need guns? Um, yes. Uh, okay. Well, as far as guns are concerned, you know, I mean, they have to protect themselves. You know, I am definitely for gun reform. I'm for that. I'm for protecting uh, as far as gun prevention. So uh, that's my answer. Thank you. Mark Tisdall. Well, relative to the 87,000 new IRS agents that were a part of the, the perhaps misnamed Inflation Reduction Act, why they're carrying guns, I don't know if that's new or not, but it was certainly a part the, of what the government chose to put in the job description, was to carry a gun and be willing to use it. As you indicated, there, there is a small number of billionaires, a relatively small number of millionaires, and, and the money lies in the middle class. It always has and it always will. And so, so you, if you're going to go after uh, the money, if you've you got to go where the money is, and that's the middle class. And this is just a part of a behavior that's, that's nothing new uh, uh, you know, in the last two years. Remember when they wanted to start tracking or identifying every time you made a, a, a withdrawal as small as $600? And that was to keep track of who's taking out cash, where is it going, you know, what's, what's going on with it, who is doing this on a regular basis. But that was dropped. Um, and then as far as, you know, and as far as the idea of fair share, um, the, 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 the top 1% of earners earn 20% of the income. So if you think proportionality, that, that top 20% should be paying 20% of the income taxes. But they pay 40%. So if, you're, if, if the top 1% is going to be 
earning 20% but paying 40%, you give them their, their fair share, they might be due a 50% tax cut. Are you sure they're paying 40%? Yes, I am. Thank, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Padma Koopa. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your question. I see it as two parts. One, um, about the IRS agents having guns. So I don't know what percentage of the IRS, guns have, uh, IRS agents have guns, so I don't know that I'm equipped because I'm a state legislator and that is a federal level issue. As far as um, the ret getting the money back from unpaid taxes, I actually have a statistic here. The top 1% of earners or uh, earners um, their share of unpaid taxes is $163 billion. So the top 1% of earners are not paying $163 billion in taxes. The top 5% of earners are not paying $307 billion. Um, and then the lowest 20% of earners actually owe less than $6 billion. So I think the challenge is to figure out where we should put our resources to figure out who we should get the money back from. Should we be looking to get the money back from the lowest 20% who only owe six billion or should we be looking to get the unpaid income taxes from the top 1% which is 163 billion. So that's, I would look at it that way and then figure out how many people you needed to get that money back. It oftentimes is that people at the top are able to hire elite lawyers to <laughs> fight the, um, uh -huh. uh, the charges and, and to keep not paying their taxes. And so I think that's, that's really what, where do you put your money to get which uh, return the most? Thank you. Michael Weber. Yeah, uh, I appreciate the question, although I, I do agree that it, it is obviously a federal issue. So, I mean, I don't know why we need 87,000 of them. I don't know why we, they need the, the guns necessarily. Um, I do believe that people should pay their fair share. There's no doubt about it. I do know several people that have gone through IRS audits, uh, businesses that go through IRS audits. It's not a fun experience, but usually it doesn't come with a gun or all these extra, you know, officers that uh, that are part of that federal, um, you know, bill. But um, it's it is concerning for a lot of people. I think there's this thought that they're they're potentially going to come after the middle class and come after you know some of the. And I think it just contributes to that anxiety. And I think that that's kind of where your question came from. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Uh, I want to ask uh, all the candidates to answer my question, and I would like the format of your answer to be either yes or no, and then an explanation of why you said yes or no. And my question will only pertain to the Michigan income tax system and not the federal. And it's a question under fair taxation for health care expenses. Now, uh, many self-employed people pay for their health insurance and uh, they pay with after-tax dollars. And uh, in Michigan, uh, the UAW members and uh, a lot of other people, the employers pay for all their uh, health insurance and are they're very generous with low deductibles and out-of-pocket expense. So my question is, uh, and these uh, people don't have to pay any taxes on their health care expenses. So my question is, will you advocate for the uh, self-employed, the gig workers, and there's plenty of them, probably more today than before the pandemic, will you advocate that they be allowed to subtract from their gross income their health care expenses especially health insurance. So they had subtracted from their gross income and then whatever's left would be the net income which the tax will be calculated on. Thank you. 
Thank you. We'll start with Mark Tisdall. Well, fair taxation relative to fair taxation relative to health care. You know, my wife and I have been uh, my wife of 45 years, who's here this evening. We, we've been self-employed for al almost 30 years, so we've paid retail for health care. We get exactly what you're talking about. There is a portion of the health care policy that individuals can deduct from their federal taxes, and I believe off of your, off of your federal adjusted gross income is what, your, is what your state tax is based upon. And then there's a formula at the federal level uh, you know, for how much of the expenses can be deducted or at what level does it start to have an impact on your adjusted gross. It's all these tax deductions uh, that, that have distorted the cost of of health insurance over the years. It's all, the, all of the different subsidies and different deductions and credits and earnings that treat large employers uh, and medium-sized employers far differently than, than, it, than it treats uh, the self-employed. And again, we, we've, we've been there. We've had, we've had policies with $10,000 $10, deductibles for each of us. We've had, we, we've had policies that you just try not to use. But uh, I'd be more than happy to look into that further. But uh, as far as how, what your gross income is, that's very much a federal issue with federal rules. Thank you. Padma Kupa. Thank you for your question. Um, I appreciate your bringing up the issues that gig workers and self-employed and consultants face. It was something that I advocated for during the height of the pandemic when the CARES Act money was going to the businesses and not necessarily to gig workers and the self-employed. Um, I would be happy to look into this further, but again, this is, um, this is a complicated issue and I would be happy to take on um, the the um, most fiscally responsible way to support all who are working. Thank you. Michael Weber. Yeah, thank you for the question, Dr. Golden. And I know, obviously, you being in the medical profession, you're, uh, you, you certainly know. Um, I, I learned a lot from uh, Rep Tisdale's question. And I also we also purchase our own health insurance now. And, it, and it's certainly eye-opening. And so I would. I would, like Rep. Koopa, I would certainly be willing to look, look at that as, as an issue. I mean, health care is one of the number one uh, issues in terms of cost and, and the anxiety that that's bringing to, uh, to different fa to families uh, throughout Michigan and throughout the 9th Senate District. Um, and if we can do something from like a tax, you know, uh, standpoint, I, I'm certainly willing to look at it. Thank you. Patricia Bernard? Yes, I'm very much, I would be interested in researching that as well. Uh, I'm definitely for small businesses, and I do know that it's a struggle. A lot of people, especially with the pandemic, that has hurt a lot of people. So, yes, it's at the federal level, but it's definitely something that I would be interested in getting involved in. Thank you. Next question. Uh, many of us here are part of an aging population, myself included. I wonder what our state legislatures can do to, uh, let's say, make the path a little easier for long-term care needs for our aging folks. And I think this is a backyard issue. It's nothing at the federal level. Thank you. We start with Padma Kupa. This is a question that I have been asking prior to my time in the legislature. Um, in 2017, 2018, before I came to the legislature, um, former state representative um, John Hoadley actually passed a bill to ensure that we would study what long-term services and supports we had in place for the aging population here in the state of Michigan. When I came to the legislature, we were 22,000 care workers short. Today, we're over 35,000 care workers short. This is such an important issue that the report and the recommendations that were uh, made 
um, need to be implemented, need to be enacted. You can find it on the, the uh, government website, the state website. But in, in addition to that, and I've been sharing it with constituents so they too can advocate because I don't hold the gavel. I can't pass policy or set the agenda. But what we have been able to do is bring together a bipartisan group of legislators. I'm the co-chair of the Legislative Care Caucus. And we work with stakeholder organizations, including AARP, Impart Alliance, um, which handles the challenges and professional it helps to professionalized caregiving so that both caregivers and care recipients, um, because people need to age with dignity. That's right. And I think it's really critical that we, it is not a partisan issue for me, this is a kitchen table issue and one that we, every one of us is going to face at some point in time. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Michael Weber. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question as well. In the Rochester area, we have a true gem in the Older Persons Commission building. And when I was on the city council um, in my early 30s, I served on that board for five years. And people said, gosh, you know, you're so young. Why, you can't even, you know, use the services. Why, why are you uh, on the board? And I said, well, you know, my wife and I, we, we were from the Rochester area. We grew up in the Rochester area. And we're going to grow old in the Rochester area. And we're going to want that Older Persons Commission uh, uh, to be a part of our lives uh, some someday as well. And so. Um, I think, you know, as I talk to seniors, I think they, you know, there's a lot of anxiety about, um, you know, the, the care worker situation, obviously what we're, what we're paying on, a, on an hourly basis and, and that kind of thing. And I know that some of those, some of that's gone up over, over the years, but it's still not enough to attract people to, to stay in the profession and, and grow in the profession. Um, in addition, I know a, a lot of, uh, seniors want, want to stay in their homes as long as they can. They want to have, you know, <coughs> independence. They want to um, be, you know, still in their homes, still, you know, receiving their families uh, for holidays and this and that. And I think we should be able to help them as much as we can to do that. Um, obviously going into uh, nursing facilities and different facilities are, are costly and, and, and people don't like them nearly as much as being independent. Thank you. Patricia Bernard? Long-term care, that is definitely something that we really need to take a look at. My dad retired from the U.S. Air Force 20 years. He had three different insurances. He had Blue Cross, he had TRICARE, and he had Medicare. And still, he ran up against ceilings of what he could do and what he could not do. I was determined that I was going to take care of my dad and he would never have to go into a nursing facility. I was told one time by a social worker, she came and she said, you know what? The worst house in the world is better than being in a nursing facility. I said, are you serious? She goes, definitely. So people want to be with their loved ones. They want to be comfortable. I mean, I literally pay long-term care insurance myself currently because when I looked at the fact that how much, have you all looked into, it's thousands of dollars a month for long-term care. Is this how we treat our elderly? So I'm definitely for doing whatever we can to make sure that as we grow older, as we all grow older, this looks like a seasoned group here, that we can uh, grow older with dignity and be able to stay in our own homes and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Tisdall. Yeah, I serve on the uh, uh, Families, Children, Seniors uh, Committee, and this is certainly one of the areas we've looked at and relative to, relative to um, in or resident care, long-term care for seniors. Uh, one of the things we need to look at is the licensing requirements, uh, the inspection requirements, uh, so that more small businesses, more home-based, community-based, neighborhood-based uh, residences uh, and individuals can get into this, this business w w with, a, with a reasonable um, uh, you know, amount of effort and, and oversight. And so that's that licensing, the inspection requirements for the smaller businesses. It's, it's very similar to childcare, you know, kind of the, the smaller neighborhood 
based child care facilities face a lot of these very same problems. And often when you get into those, uh, we've been through it with my parents, my, my wife's uh, father, uh, her, her grandparents, often the, the smaller neighborhood based facilities are, 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 are just provide better hands on care, but we have to make it easier for those business people to get into the business and to, st and to stay in business and, and eliminate many of the burdens that are maybe don't apply to them or are unnecessary for the smaller for the smaller homes. Thank you. Hi, thank you for this, taking this question. Over the last several decades, our local governments have seen reductions in revenue from the state, causing cities and townships to reduce services, including police and fire departments. Do you agree, and what have you done, or what will you do to ensure that the state fully funds local governments? Thank you. I believe we're starting with Michael Weber. Well, I, I appreciate the question. As a, as a seven-year uh, Rochester Hills City Council member before I ran uh, for the State House, I certainly understand uh, what you're talking about. We did have, uh, during my time, we did have increases to, the, to that revenue sharing each year, but certainly it didn't fully keep up with um, you know, inflation, it, you know, different things like that. So as a local... Uh, as somebody that comes from a local government background, I've always been an advocate for increased revenue sharing. At the same token, um, you know, some communities are in better uh, position than others. Rochester Hills, we have no legacy costs. We were an old township that became a city. We were always on a 401k uh, plan. Um, you know, other cities have those legacy costs that unfortunately are now coming due or are or, or past due. Um, and that's where the state obviously, un unfortunately, has had to step in, uh, you know, in some of those situations, which I know has been problematic. Um, so we do, we have to increase the, the revenue sharing as best we can, uh, but I'm not sure it will ever be made whole from the standpoint of inflation and, and, and keeping up with, with, with where maybe you, you think or I think it it should be so thank you Patricia Bernard I would just say I'm looking at as far as I'm in agreement with what has been said here as far as the revenue sharing but the more that we can keep at our local levels the more we would have control over our communities so I would be interested in I would go for being able to um, try to see what we could do, how much we could get at the local area so that we can take care of our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Tisdall. Well, I've sponsored a, a bill along with um, uh, uh, Representative Jim Ellison. He, he, he sponsored a trust, a, a revenue sharing trust bill, and my bill provides for the dedicated taxation uh, and, and the dedication of existing taxes that would fund that trust, that would bring revenue sharing back up to the, to the 2011 uh, level. We're never going to get back to where we were because it, it's, it's it, right now it's in, it, annually, the revenue, uh, uh, local revenue sharing, uh, local government revenue sharing is a part of the appropriations process and it's used to, to balance the budget. You go back to the 2000-2001 uh, recession, the 2008, uh, you come out of that, um, uh, they were, revenue sharing was lowered to balance the budget. It's never come back up. So we're just trying to get it back up to the 2011 uh, level, put dedicated funding into a trust that can only be used for revenue sharing, use the 1970s formula that, 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 again, it's been around and recognized for half a century, and take it out of the appropriations process. And if you're ever going to adjust it, you make it a vote of, uh, on the floor of both the House and the Senate. Get it out of just appropriations. Thank you. Padma Kupa. Thank you for that question. Um, there's a really important website. If any of you have time, 
save my cities. I've been working even before my time in the legislature with municipal governments as a planning commissioner, as a member of the community, as we developed our master plan to figure out how we address the shortages. Uh, the state has been balancing its budget on the backs of local governments over the last several decades. And there is an acknowledgement that we need to fix our funding model for our cities, our villages, our townships, and our counties. Police, fire, and EMS all depend on the revenue that we send to the state that needs to come back to local governments. Um, in fact, Representative Tisdale mentioned the trust fund. It is something that I have been advocating for since the day I walked into Lansing because when we had the last recession, the city of Troy almost cut their police department in half and an organization that I serve as the president of, the Troy Historical Society, used to be part of the city services. Unfortunately, that and the Troy Nature Center, the Troy Historic Village and the Troy Nature Center are now independent nonprofits that have to operate because we are not able to, at the city, manage those local services. This is a really important issue um, that must be addressed for the long haul. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. And thank you all for being here and you guys too for your questions. Two of you are now sitting in the legislature. All four of you want to be sitting there. And as you started out the evening asking about medical freedom questions and where you would draw that line. And my question is, as more and more medical questions get discussed in the legislature, where are you going to fall on LBGQ, transgender, and abortion? And please rationalize your decision. Thank you. I believe we're starting with Patricia Bernard this time. Okay. Well, I am definitely, one of the things that I do understand right now is that all of our rights are being attacked. Our civil rights, our women's rights, our voter rights, and I can go on and on. And I am very, very concerned about that. Um, as it relates to abortion, I am definitely for uh, abortion. I believe that it is the individuals, it's between the individual person, their God, and their doctor. And it should not be a community conversation. People don't want, a lot of people don't want to take the immunizations, they don't want to wear the mask, but then they're saying that you need to make a 10-year-old child have a baby because you're saying that according, taking us back to 1931, that abortion should be considered murder and that a 10-year-old child should be forced to have a baby, whether she's raped or whatever it might be, incest, whatever it may be, or just life might be in danger, and I am totally, totally against that. Now, as far as LGBTQ and uh, transgender and all that, it, it all falls in line. I mean, that's back to our individual rights being attacked. You know, how can you say on one hand that you want to give people rights to wear a mask or to not have to take vaccines, but on the other hand, you're telling a woman that she has to have a baby? It doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Tisdall. Yes. Relative to abortion, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-life. I've been endorsed by Right to Life uh, uh, the last election and this election. And as I said in the, in, in the last candidate forum, until we figure out, until both sides of the aisle can figure out what is the fetus, when is the fetus deserving of the fundamental constitutional rights in the first eight amendments, it, until we can figure that out, there's going to be a divide, and there's going to there's going to be everything from life is precious from the from the moment of conception to uh, 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 abortion is is fine on demand up until the, the 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 fetus or the baby leaves the birth canal. So until we until we until we make that decision, what is the fetus and when is it de when is it deserving of those constitutional rights? 
Um, this is going to be this is going to be a contested issue. LGBTQ individual rights. Every individual has the right to be who they are, and I I don't know. I don't know that people are being rejected for expressing who they are, um, and, but if someone's individual rights are being oppressed, uh, whoever is doing the oppressing uh, needs to be brought, you know, to justice the full extent of the law. Thank you. Padma Kupa. Thank you for that important question. I'm a person of faith. I regard all life as sacred, but we cannot criminalize any aspects of health care. We must allow doctors to provide essential health care and also to allow people privacy in their medical decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Weber. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the question. Um, you know, abortion is a very personal issue for a lot of people. And um, while I'm personally, uh, while I personally choose life as, as somebody that grew up Catholic, I do recognize that the Dobbs decision um, has essentially punted the issue back to each individual state for the people to decide. And I think by the end of this week, we're going to find out if this ballot proposal is going to be on the ballot. And that will give the, the people, the citizens, uh, an opportunity to vote on, on this very important issue. And so that's where I see that particular issue at this point in time in our state's history. With regard to LGBTQ rights, uh, I support, as Rep. Tisdale said, I support individual rights. And, um, um, you know, I think we all have people in our family, people that we love, people that we know um, that are uh, LGBTQ. And um, I, I love my family members and I respect my family members um, completely, um, you know, regardless of where they're at on that spectrum. Thank you. Our next question. What measures have you taken or will you take to prevent gun violence? I'm going to repeat that. What measure have you taken or will you take to prevent gun violence? Uh, we're going to start with Mark Tisdall, I believe. Well, just last month, um, I was the lead sponsor on a four bill package, bipartisan package, two Republicans and two Democrats, that would codify what are safe gun storage practices that were taken from the NRA, uh, the, the National, the, the U.S. Uh, Concealed Carry Association and, and everytown.org right off their websites. But we would codify that into law. And, and what two of the bills would do is if you follow these rules, you follow these best practices and, and your gun ends up in the hands of a criminal and, and causes damage, injury, or death, the state gives you a positive defense, a criminal shield, or a civil liability shield, again, if, if, you, if you follow those best practices. The, the, the other two parts of the bill recognize that in order to follow those best practices, uh, you might have to purchase some hardware, a gun safe, a handgun safe, trigger locks, a vault for your long rifles. Uh, there's up to a $350 a year tax credit that would offset that expense that you would incur to comply. Uh, there's also a $350 tax credit available for training. We want you to be trained. We want you to understand gun safety and storage and ammunition and what rights you have to defend yourself and, and, and that you don't. So there's, there's a tax credit, $350 tax credit available for training. And also in that, there's a, there's a tax deduction available if you purchase a, a uh, handgun or firearm liability policy. 
we want you to be insured in case there's an accident. We know that, that there are collectible dollars there. So, yeah, ours is the only, uh, ours is the only bipartisan package of bills that's been introduced, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Thank you. Padma Kupa. Thank you. Um, I just want to take a minute to acknowledge that I didn't respond to the LGBTQ portion of the prior question, and I just want to say I actually got uh, to be in the Supreme Court of the state of Michigan when our Attorney General presented arguments that the LGBTQ community is deserving of full rights. Um, I think that's a very important uh, decision. We have had legislation upon legislation um, that's been introduced, but the majority party will not advance it to ensure LGBTQ rights. In fact, in the House, we have not been able to even have um, a, a resolution, a proclamation um, uh, fully to acknowledge Pride Month, um, and it is very disappointing. Um, also disappointing, while I appreciate uh, my colleagues' uh, mention of the bipartisan bill package, in my first term and in my second term, we've had numerous pieces of legislation that speak to safe gun storage, red flag laws, and uh, background checks, and other bipartisan, legisl bipartisan legislation that's been passed in other states bipartisan, in a bipartisan manner. Yet our legislature has not even had a hearing on any of these bills. It's not until recently that we've had this bipartisan package, but we've had bills that we've worked with a number of organizations like Every Town for Gun Safety, Moms Demand Action, and the Gifford Center. I'm very proud that I have the Gun Sense Distinction candidate uh, endorsement from Moms Demand Action, but I really think that being part of the Firearm Safety and Gun Violence Prevention Caucus with a number of legislators um, across both chambers and even across the aisle has been very um, helpful to me in being able to advocate for what many members of our community have been asking for. Thank you. Michael Weber? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question and it's certainly uh, a challenging issue for not only our state and nation um, when, when the Oxford shooting happened right down the street from us, um, it was a tragedy. Um, at the same time, our sheriff um, noted there was over 40 gun laws that were violated, um, you know, during that. And so, you know, I, I come at it from the standpoint that we do have a lot of laws that are already on the books dealing with law-abiding citizens, obtaining and owning a, a, a firearm. I'm open to looking at other legislation, uh, and I applaud uh, Rep Tisdale for uh, working on bipartisan legislation. I think the key to any of these difficult issues is to work across the aisle, to work in a bipartisan fashion, to get all the stakeholders together. And I don't see that with a lot of the legislation that's um, produced by the other side of the aisle. Um, over the years, it would be really good to work with law enforcement, work with some of the gun rights groups, and work with every town, moms demand action, and stuff like that to see if we can't find some common ground on some of these issues. Thank you. Patricia Bernard? It is my understanding that over 70 to 80 percent of people want us to do something regarding gun violence. And it doesn't make sense for people to act as if they're trying to handle it when you can't even get meetings. I, I don't get it. I do get it. Some people are being bought by the NRA. That's what I believe. And I am definitely for uh, secure gun storage, red flag, I mean, all of these different things. I believe it came up to appease the public. What are we really going to do about it? And I just think that what's happening here is there's a lot of, uh, politics being put over people versus people taking people into consideration over politics. This country is in trouble. We're acting worse than a third world country right now when it comes to gun violence. AR-15s, they need to be banned. Now, I work for the Department of Army. 
We can bring an 18-year-old in, but he's going to be under a controlled environment. We need to stop playing games. That's all that's happening here. We're acting like we're trying to get something done. And I'm saying we because I'm sitting here, but I'm new to all of this. <laughs> but I'm telling you, we're in trouble. Our rights, our, our democracy is in trouble. And we need to really think about what we're hearing today. Who's authentic or who's just the run of the mill? Go along to get along. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question. Thank you for taking my question. So how can we avoid making the same mistakes with water infrastructure that we've seen recently were made in Jackson, Mississippi? Thank you. I believe we're starting with Padma Koopa. Thank you for the question. I'm an engineer. I look at things and I see problems that need to be fixed. Uh, our investment in infrastructure is critical. We need to make sure that we plan for the future, particularly for ex extreme climate conditions. We seem to see those happening on a more frequent basis. And if we do not take into account what is happening and plan accordingly, we will be in trouble. Um, again, it goes back to we've had decades of underfunding our local governments, and we need to make sure that we don't balance the state budget on the backs of our cities, villages, townships, and counties who can actually make local decisions to figure out what can be done to ensure that our infrastructure is resilient. Thank you. Michael Weber. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question. And, um, you know, when, when I was serving on the city council, we certainly uh, worked a lot on our underground um, infrastructure. It, and it is lagging. Um, there, there's no doubt about it. Um, we had this discussion when I first got in the legislature in 2015, and we were able to, for the first time in, since 1997, um, dedicate $1.2 billion annually to our, our local roads, our roads, bridges, and infrastructure. And that's the last time any new revenue or, or new dedicated money has been put towards our infrastructure. Now there's discussion about raising the gas tax. Certainly there's discussion about um, you know, electric vehicles. And, and, and if they're not going to have gas, how, how do we get them involved in terms of um, paying for our, our roads? Um, but we're seeing um, the underground piece of it being such a big part. I know in Rochester Hills, whenever they do a local project, they take that into account. And if there are the underground pipes that need repair, they do it at the same time while the road's being uh, dug up. Not every community can do that, um, but I think we need to work with them to incentivize that. Uh, we just saw recently um, City of Benton Harbor uh, the state has been replacing all their lead lines, um, and I think that it's now up to maybe 80 percent has been changed, and they're going to get to 100 percent soon. And that was a state project, um, and, and that would be something that I would be supportive of on on that case. So, thank you, Patricia Bernard. Well, it's my understanding. I guess with Michigan, there's like 11 billion dollars uh, that is going to be spent for the next four years. Um, seven billion towards roads, 1.7 billion towards internet access, 1.3 billion for water infrastructure, uh, one billion for public transportation and bridge repair. And I can go on and on. It's going to be broke down. Um, I am definitely for that because, as you can see, we're steadily having issues pop up where we have to take care of our infrastructure. We just have to make sure that we pull the right people together to make sure there's some accountability on how. Um, the money is going to be spent and how it's going to be executed. Thank you. Mark Tisdall. Yes, uh, in this recent budget, there's six billion dollars this year uh, in, in, in infrastructure spending roads. That was on top of 4.7 billion that was signed uh, into law. That was the federal infrastructure uh, dollars that that came in and. You, you need to requ require your local officials to spend that money wisely and fully. 
There's not an, uh, uh, fixing sewers is not very sexy. There's not a lot of photo ops that go into that. Uh, Rochester Hills, we're very fortunate here and the city of Rochester, um, but we're, we're very fortunate in that we have fully invested in our infrastructure system during the last uh, uh, boil water alert. We have a, 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 a computerized system with sensors all throughout our water our, our, our water infrastructure. Uh, we had no drop in pressure that would have allowed a backflow of contaminated water into our system. We're very fortunate to have that kind of thing here in Rochester Hills. And we've dedicated the money to, uh, and the effort and the political will to get that done. But that's not the case in all cities. It has to start at the ground level with residents with citizens requiring their local communities, counties, and states to take this seriously and to fully fund these projects. Thank you. Got everybody right. Next question. Oh, sorry. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I know you all care about everyone's rights. My question is, when it comes to women's sports, how will you support them if you put transgenders against them? I believe we're starting with Michael Weber this time. You, you know, I thank you uh, for that question. I know that that's been a hot topic um, in our in our country. Um, I don't really know what what the answer is from a state level. Um, I think. It, at the local levels, these, these school districts, um, certainly when you get to uh, college level, it's, it's athletic uh, departments, athletic, uh, like the Big Ten, like athletic conferences that I think have to, have to do that on a case by case. I know the, um, it, you know, I know obviously the, the one uh, swimmer um, that's been getting a lot of notoriety and, and, you know, uh, I, as I've talked with, with obviously some women, um, you know, they think, they think that's very unfair because you essentially have a, a man that's, that's, you know, uh, dominating that. Um, and so I think it's going to be something where, uh, you know, women and women's organizations are going are gonna to speak up on something like that as, as well and, and certainly can have a better voice than I can. Thank you. Patricia Bernard? Well, I just think that with everything else, you know, there's new things, there's new issues that come about, and it just needs to be research. And there may have to be more research as to is there a real difference? Can there be a difference when it comes to the sports? And I would just go along with the research and the results of that. Thank you. Mark Tisdall? If you allow biological men to compete in women's sports, you're undoing decades of Title IX spending and dedication that's built women's sports in the United States up to where it is today. There are, there are physical, genetic differences that cannot be undone with you know, for example, well, this individual's been on X number of months of hormone treatment. In many sports, that's called doping. They're automatically, they're automatically disqualified. But if you want to keep the Title IX progress that we've had in place, if you want to honor women's participation in sports, you have to keep biological men out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Padma Kupa. Um, this is a really important question as well. Um, I really want to talk about Title IX since my colleague brought it up. Title IX is a federal civil rights law in the United States that was enacted in 1972 as part of the education amendments. The first Asian American woman in Congress um, from Hawaii was the one who wrote the language or co-authored it. It prohibits sex-based discrimination in any school or any other education program that receives fed funding from the federal government. 
Um, this year was the 50th anniversary of Title IX. I wanted to introduce a resolution in the state legislature to commemorate that, and I was denied that opportunity. Um, I think it's really important that we uh, honor the importance of um, allowing all people to participate in sports. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Good evening. Uh, what I'd like to know is, are you committed to keeping Michigan a right to work state? I'll re repeat it again. Are you committed to keeping Michigan a right to work state? Thank you. Thank you. I think we're starting with Patricia Bernard this time. As far as right to work, you know, I'm definitely for unions. I'm definitely for making sure that um, the unions protect the people. And so that is what I'm for. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Tisdall? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Padma Kupa. Thank you. One of the rights that is critical to people is the right to organize. And I strongly support the right of people to ensure they have benefits, that they have uh, equal pay, and the right to organize. Thank you. Michael Weber? Yes, and I do believe that it, it protects the individual worker in their decision whether or not they want to be a part of the union or not. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, in, 19, well, in 1995, the state of Michigan gutted its polluter pay laws, and uh, since then, it has largely been up to um, to pay for the cleanup of businesses here in the state of Michigan. State of Michigan, so I would love to hear all responses or no support to um, reinstating the pay laws here. Thank you. Are we with you, Mark? I think so. Mark. Oh. Yes. And I, I'm not particularly familiar with the polluter pay laws or what was done in, in 1995. I know, when, I know when here serving on the city council in Rochester Hills, for example, um, uh, it used to be called so Softball City that's right off of, uh, 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 what is it, Hamlin and 59. There's 100 plus acres there of what was illegal dump, and it, it, wasn't, our, it wasn't our chemicals and trash being dumped there. It was, it was, it was uh, uh, companies uh, c coming out of Wayne County and at, back in the day, in the 50s and 60s, and dumping these, those things out here. Um, we've had a, a, at, at Hamlin and Adams, there's, a, there's a, the legacy of Rochester Hills, and we helped with abatements. Uh, they paid $14 million to clean up a, a, uh, uh, an illegal dump that was at that site for, for decades. Uh, and now there's going to be 368 um, you know, luxury apartments there. Uh, we have uh, 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 illegal dump sites along De along DeQuinder on the east side of the city. There's just land that's just sitting there. And so we've been fighting to get additional dollars in from the state and, and from the federal government to address these issues. Um, if there is a change in the law that can effectuate that, make it faster, uh, uh, bring more dollars to, to cleaning up these illegal sites, uh, I, I would take a long, hard, serious look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Padma Kupa? So I'm a mom. I taught my children, one of whom is here in the audience, that they should clean up the messes they make. And I believe that is true of those who pollute any part of our beautiful state. 
Um, there have been many packages introduced in the legislature, and I'm very proud to say that I actually introduced a bill to ensure that polluters pay and that we do not have the fox guarding the hen house. When we appoint people to an environmental rules panel, they should not be the ones deciding um, whether they made a mess or not. It should be done without conflict of interest, and we should make sure that if somebody poisons our water or any of our beautiful uh, natural resources here in the state of Michigan, which are critical to our tourism industry. Ms. Koopa. We, um, it is important that we expect polluters to pay. Michael Weber. Thank you. I appreciate the question. And, you know, I, I do have to admit I'm not familiar with the 1995 polluter pay laws. But I will go back to uh, what Rep Tisdale talked about. I was on the Brownfield Authority here in Rochester Hills for uh, two or three years, and we worked with different developers that wanted to develop on these contaminated sites, and they had to clean up the site in order to do anything. And so they were incentivized to do that, and a lot of times they, they were not, they were the owners of the property, but they were not necessarily the original polluters of that. So obviously from a standpoint of the, the, the polluters from, you know, for instance, the, the, uh, the trash dumping site that we have, the, the suburban softball, um, the, the people that own that, um, obviously it would have been much better and, and much more uh, available for development if it was clean in the first place because they, they look at the cleanup costs as obviously part of the construction and part of the development costs and it delays a lot of these projects. Um, so, but ultimately it's a win-win because you do get the site cleaned. Thank you. Patricia Bernard. I am definitely for protecting our environment and our natural resources. And so, you know, if you pollute, you need to pay. Um, and I think that they need to really execute policies to let people know that they have to take care of our environment. I'm for clean air, clean water, uh, clean energy. All of those good things are going to take us to another level. So yes, I, I'm, I'm for the fact that if you pollute, you have to pay. Yes, Mark Chisdell. Well, again, in many of these decades old uh, landfills that we have around here, illegal dumps, illegal landfills, it's very difficult to know who the polluter was. And so you've got to take that, take that into account. It's not pollution that was generated here in the greater Rochester Hills area. Um, but when it's patently obvious who the polluter is, then I, then I think, uh, uh, again, they're, they're probably in violation of multiple laws and they should be held to the full extent of the law. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Um, what are some ways that you plan to address the current teacher, sh teacher shortage that we are facing across the state? Hello. I think we're starting with you, Padma Koopa. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the question because we have a shortage of a lot of things, including bus drivers. Um, I think one of the ways that we ensure uh, that we have enough educators is by incentivizing them to go, people to go into that profession. Just as we incentivize companies to come to Michigan to employ people, we need to incentivize people to go into the teaching profession. We need to respect and value our educators. Both my parents are educators, they're retired now. But I know that this is a very, uh, call, it's a calling for a lot of people to go into teaching as a profession. We entrust the lives of our children with them and we need to make sure that we fix our school funding model. Um, this was done, the current model that we're using is from over 25 years ago and it was done during lame duck and it is time that we work together we have solutions the fundmyschools.org website has ideas and proposals and it was from a wide range of stakeholders including administrators teachers and families and businesses education is the backbone of our economy and educators are critical to that thank you 
Thank you. Michael Weber? Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. It's a, it's a very serious topic, especially for uh, a dad of a fourth, uh, now fourth grader uh, at uh, uh, one of our Rochester community schools. Um, you know, I, I think a couple things. I, I, I agree with Rep Koopa that we do have to incentivize uh, folks to, to join the profession. But also, I think, and, and this is a local issue more than a state issue, uh, and, and obviously they need the funding to, to do this, but I think we need to have a higher average pay for, for these new teachers and, and, and um, um, try to keep them in, in the system. I mean, they, they get in, they have low pay, and then they, they see uh, other opportunities, and, and we lose a lot of them in the first four or five years. And, and uh, so we're losing folks that, that went to school to teach, they have a passion to teach, and um, and they're driven out um, uh, of the profession. Um, so, uh, you know, that's something. As as I've talked with folks, that's something that that is contractually negotiated at at these local school district levels. But at the same token, um, we and we are, uh, you know, we can certainly look at the funding formula. But the the funding has been going up every year, and. And in fact, the legislature has been working in a bipartisan fashion to try to close the funding gap between the lower funded per pupil schools and the higher funded schools. And I think it's a, it's a laudable goal that they've been able to uh, achieve that um, in this most recent budget. Thank you. Patricia Bernard. Well, first of all, we definitely need to um, pay our educators more money. Um, I have family members that are educators and normally when they really get into teaching it's because it comes from the heart and they really love what they do but unfortunately uh, we need to incentivize them to want to stay we need to make sure that our classroom sizes and our resources are available we need to make sure that we keep our public schools fully funded that we do not take funds from our public schools to pay for private schools I don't have a problem with private schools, you know, but I know that as a mother of three, I couldn't afford to send my children to a uh, private school. And they were able to get a quality education here in Rochester Hills uh, Community Schools because of the fact that we were able to support that. So when I look at that, also our teachers should feel safe. You know, they shouldn't have to feel like they have to bring, be armed with guns. They should be armed with books. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Tisdall? In our most recent education budget, this year it's $19.6 billion. It's about 30% of the entire budget goes to uh, K through 12 higher ed, community college, and, and, and the Michigan Department of Education. Um, there are five, there's $575 million in this recent budget for uh, training. Uh, recruitment and retaining of teachers but similar to licensing uh, it you you, you, you you we need to look at the requirements for getting talented people into the classroom I think we need to we need to relook at the certification uh, requirements for for teachers and we also we need to maybe replace that and consider professional experience and professional credentials if you have a uh, a, a 20 year experience engineer that wants to go in and, and, and teach upper level math, or you have a, a chemical engineer that wants to come in and, keep, and teach chemistry, are we gonna keep that individual out because they don't have a, the, the proper certificate? We've gotta look at all those things, make it easier for, for people to get into the pro profession. Last but not least, you have to reconnect responsibility for results with authority on curriculum. Um, it, it seems like the authority is more and more centralized. The teachers feel as though they're responsible for the outcomes, but they don't have the authority to directly act upon uh, what they see right in front of their faces to, to drive those outcomes. Thank you. And this is our last question. Um, Thank you for coming tonight, uh, I guess. I would like to start with uh, Michael Weber on this one, um, but for, if you could all answer it. Uh, yes or no, do you agree with the recent Michigan Court of Appeals decision that no-fault reform should not apply to survivors injured prior to the signing of PA-21? And I do have one follow-up. I, 
Uh, and the follow-up is for um, Representative Tisdale, why are bipartisan bills still stuck in committee? Okay, that was directed initially at you, Michael Weber. Uh, yes, I, I would agree with that decision just from the standpoint that when we passed uh, the legislation, there certainly was some unintended consequences, and I think that that's what uh, came out of this court uh, decision. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I've always been a supporter of the no-fault. I, I mean, if you followed my career at all, um, in, in both my first session and second session had quite uh, the challenge with getting uh, around any sort of no-fault reforms that were um, put together in those terms. What ended up changing and the reason why there was strong bipartisan support and it was signed by Governor Whitmer um, on the law that passed in 2019 was because we gave people options. Instead of telling people we had to um, just uh, t you know, take the unlimited option, we, we offered the unlimited option, but then we, we offered other options as well. And, um, and I think that that's, we offer different insurance options for a lot of different other, you know, insurance products. And so I think that that was uh, a good reform, but obviously it brought some unintended consequences. Thank you. And Mark Tisdall, I believe the follow-up was directed at you. Yeah. Um, you know, again, on, that, on, on the Court of Appeals, I'm 32 years in the insurance business, medical malpractice insurance, but have a pretty good understanding of the, of the theory. And the, once that once those no-fault policies were triggered by a covered loss, that coverage stays in, in place for the lifetime of that patient. Now, those contracts and the law at, at, at that time did not have um, fee schedules attached to them like the current law, with the exception of, the, of 12 home care uh, codes that aren't covered. So it's, I, I don't know how we're going to square that hole where you can retroactively attach something to a contract that didn't, that didn't have a fee schedule attached to it in the first place. But that's, what the, that's, that's the battle that's going to be ongoing in the courts. And this will end up in front of the Supreme Court. Why are bipartisan bills languishing in, in committee? Uh, um, you know, a representative, Phil Green, Repu Republican out of the thumb, ha has been pushing this and pushing this. I served on a four-person work group. We were given the, the task in the month of February to come up with some answers. Um, but right now, it's, it, this took effect relative to the attendant care, the home care, and, and um, in July of, of 2021. So a lot of people are looking at it saying there's not enough history. You know, uh, the other thing that's qu quite frankly a, an issue in this is it, 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 it really falls on the backs of 6,700 Michiganders that are spread all over the state and there's just not a lot of political oomph there, so to speak. Mr. But, Tisdale. But um, so, yeah, it's more time. It's, it's a lack of, of, of political power. And sooner or later, it is going to have to be addressed. And this, is, it's, it, this, this issue is going to end up in the Supreme Court. Patricia Bernard, do you want to respond to that or Padma Kuba? Thank okay. you. Um, in March of 2021, um, now Senator, then Representative Doug Wozniak, introduced a bill, House Bill 4486, in addition to the one that Representative Tisdale mentioned from Phil Green. I am a co-sponsor of both those bills. In addition, and that what that would do would be to amend uh, the public act that we passed in 20, uh, the overhaul of auto no fault, but it would have uh, amended a uh, section of the law that would ensure and revise the reimbursement provisions for rehabilitation clinics for medical treatment. Um, and then I really want to uh, draw attention to 
uh, the protectautonofault.org website. There was a bicameral group of 73 legislators. We so signed a memo in support of a bipartisan amicus brief filed by now, um, Representative Julie Brixey and the late Andrea Schroeder. And it brings tears because Andrea is gone. She worked so hard to try to bring us all together. And that bill, those two bills are languishing in the insurance committee. And there are members of the, the legislature who could have taken them up. But again, I'm a member of the Democratic minority. We have not been able to get, even with Republican support, we have not been able to get those uh, bills moved. I have crossed into the chamber with people in wheelchairs who are begging for us to take those bills up. Those people in wheelchairs were pushed by our safety security officers out of the speaker's office when they went to advocate. And it, it is it is very um, di disappointing to say the least that we are not seeing any action um, on any of this because it's so harmful to those who are vulnerable. Thank oh. you for bringing that up. Thank you. Everybody good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, candidates and audience. We will now begin our, begin our closing statements. The candidates will have 30 seconds to make a closing statement. Uh, the order for speaking for this segment will be in the reverse order of the opening statements. We will begin with the state representative Republican candidate, Mark Tisdall. Well, learning loss, family business losses, inflation, soaring fuel costs, and the disaster that closing line five would bring to that, the unemployment insurance mess, and three vetoes of personal tax relief. Fighting to fix these issues is why the Michigan uh, Restaurant and Lodging Association and the Small Business Association of Michigan each named me their legislator of the year in 2021-2022, respectively. I'm asking your vote. Please send me back to Lansing. My work there has just begun. Thank you. Thank you. State Representative Democrat candidate Patricia Bernard. I truly believe after working for the Department of Army for 34 years, retiring as a GS-15, knowing what goes on with secret documents and everything else, our democracy is at attack. And I believe that we need to all wake up, those that are not in tuned in to understand that. So I am willing to fight for women's reproductive rights, individual rights, civil rights, making sure that our public schools are maintained to be quality uh, and not take money from our public schools to fund private schools for profit. I am for making sure that Please small businesses get what they need, gun violence reduction and, and all. So I am for putting people over politics. Ms. Bernard. Thank you. State Senate Republican candidate, Michael Weber. Again, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. You can learn more about me at www.electweber.com. During my time on the city council as a state representative and in the private sector, I have worked with others to get things done. We need to send a leader to Lansing who can be effective and work with others to get our state back on track. I'm Michael Weber, and I humbly ask for your vote on November 8th or via absentee ballot. Thank you. State Senate Democrat candidate Padma Kupa. Thank you very much to the League of Women Voters, um, Oakland area, for hosting this, to all of you for asking tough questions, and also for attending and hearing our responses. I'm Padma Kupa. I'm the candidate for State Senate District 9. You can learn more about me and my positions at electpadmakupa.com. Um, also check my state legislative history at, at my uh, website there. Uh, my legislative agenda is defined by my community outreach, which began decades before my time in the legislature. As a representative, my legislative team and I have organized Ms. decades, uh, hundreds of events, and attended hundreds, I've attended hundreds of events, and I believe that I stay abreast of my constituents' concerns Ms. by Cooper. engaging with people in the community. I look forward to receiving your vote and your support in the upcoming election on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting us. Thank you. 
The League appreciates all candidates and members of the audience for participating in this program. We would like to thank the City of Rochester Hills for making this forum possible and Jason Dale for all his help. It will be rebroadcast daily on Rochester Hills channels WOW, Channel 10, Comcast, Channel 20, and AT&T, Channel 99, at both 7.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. It will also be available on demand on the city's website, rochesterhills.org, and the League's website, lwvoa.org. The League has prepared a voter guide for the upcoming general election, which is also online at website vote411.org. By simply typing in your address, you can view the biographical information as well as responses to questions asked of all candidates that will be on your ballot. We hope this candidate's forum has been beneficial and will help you cast an informed vote. Please remember to vote on Tuesday, November 8th. Thank you.